Musical History Podcast, part of the Proceedings Podcast, sponsored by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with Tomorrow's Technologies. As the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. Well, every March, our minds around here go back to March of 1862, when naval history and the um, nature of naval warfare changed forever with history's first clash of ironclads on March 9th, 1862 at Hampton Roads, Virginia, as the USS Monitor went up against the CSS Virginia. Um, Naval battles don't get more game changing than this one. Perhaps it was strategically, perhaps it was tactically a draw, strategically, most likely an advantage for the Union, of course. But the main thing that's important about this battle is how it changed the nature of how warships would be made and how they would be fought in all the years to follow. We all know this, uh, this famous battle. We all know the famous ships uh, that took place. They were so unique. The CSS Virginia reincarnated from the USS Merrimack and now looking like something out of a Jules Verne novel, a man-made sea monster, cruising down the river and crushing a couple of US warships, wooden warships, like a knife through butter. But on the second day of that Battle of Hampton Roads, she met up with the USS Monitor, and everybody can picture the Monitor as well. Probably few vessels are more instantly recognizable to anybody on hearing her name. The much vaunted cheese box on a raft, that flat deck flush to the water with that round turret atop it. Nothing else had quite looked like it. But what if, after all these years and all the depictions of that battle, the Monitor actually looked different that day. Here to discuss this intriguing theory is the author of our cover story in the current issue of Naval History Magazine. He volunteers at the USS Monitor Center and he's extensively photographed and documented the Monitor's turret during conservation of that celebrated and rediscovered wreck. He frequently lectures on Civil War Naval history and he contributed a chapter to Craig Simon's book, Union Combined Operations in the Civil War. And he's written about the Monitor previously, both for us in naval history, as well as Civil War times. So please join me in welcoming Francis DeCoyne. Fran, hello, and welcome to the podcast. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to discussing this with you. Yeah, well, this is a groundbreaking theory about one of the most <laughs> celebrated ships in American naval history. Um, let's zero in on the gist of it, and then uh, you can sort of retrace the steps that led you to stumble on this, it seems like, forgotten major detail of a major mm -hmm. historical mm -hmm. moment. Right. Um, we're talking about the turret and how it actually, on the day of the battle with Virginia, wasn't that round turret everybody iconically remembers. In fact, it was squared off at the end. Right. So um, you found quite an intriguing trail of clues through the historical record that had just sort of never been put together before. So um, why don't you tell the viewers and listeners how this all came about? Well, the um, the armor plate that's in the museum at um, the Naval Academy, I've been aware of that since I was a child. Um, my parents took me there um, like 60 years ago, maybe longer. Um, and I, uh, as a child, I thought it was fascinating that the actual piece of the monitor was right there that you could see and touch and experience. Uh, I always thought that people should make a big deal about it, and but unfortunately, it, it really wasn't. Um, in the 70s, I uh, contacted Professor Darden at the academy. I was pretty young, but I had some questions. and He uh, sent me the um, three-volume set of Project Cheesebox, which was one of the first um, modern studies of the monitor um, done by the, the, the midshipmen there. Um, and I read through it, and they didn't mention the, the armor plate either, even though it was right there on the academy's grounds where they were working. Um, others had had pictures of it in their books or magazine articles, and it just got put aside as this piece of the monitor without any any notations on it. 
uh, for ever, I was aware of Steimer's letter in, OR, in the official records of the Union Confederate Navies that talked about, um, he, right after the battle, same day, he wrote to Erickson and he said, your turret is wonderful. The pendulums, which were the port stoppers for the gun ports, were wonderful, he said, but he didn't think much of the, uh, the shield. And I thought, well, I thought he always meant on the inside of the turret, there was these nut guards that would supposed to protect the crew. And I thought he was talking about that. And then later, um, I had an opportunity as part of a project to begin to transcribe the, um, um, the, the log of the monitor. And in the log of the monitor, I came across this, this reference where it said that the shield had been removed from the turret that day. Um, so I began to put things together slowly. And then again, in, in uh, Ernest Peterkin's uh, uh, comprehensive book on the drawings of the US S monitor, there's this picture of the, the shield that's, that's there. So for a long time, I thought it was just something that was cool from the monitor. And then I thought later on that it was maybe part of the deck, it, you know, this, this, the picture in the article shows this curved portion of, of the plate. And I thought it was probably uh, by a coal scuttle. Uh, and it was damaged from when the Virginia tried to, to ram the monitor. So sl slowly, as I realized that I just began to put things together, um, it, it, more and more things led to that this was the shield that was on the turret in front of the gun ports during the battle. Well, about eight years ago, I uh, kind of wrote this up, made a little PowerPoint presentation, and I sent it to a friend of mine who's a very well-known naval historian. Uh, and I emailed it to him, and he got back to me within like a half hour. He wanted to know more about this and what it was and, and how he came up with this idea. And I explained it to him, and he said that he thought it was um, very interesting, but he said, Where's your smoking gun? You have no smoking gun. You know, without a smoking gun, it's a cute story, but you can't do anything with it. So I just dropped it. About a year ago, I was thinking about it, and I thought, wait a second. The armor plate itself is the smoking gun. Gustavus Fox was at the battle on the Minnesota during the battle between the Monmouth and Virginia. I mean, he wasn't just at the battle. If he was on the Minnesota, he was in the battle. He saw what went on. He was one of the first people to go on the monitor after the battle. He was Erickson's main guru. Uh, maybe that's not the right term, but main proponent for, for monitors. Erickson, in his study, in his, in his home, the only photograph he had was of Gustavus Fox. And he would tell people, this man is the is m most responsible for my success because Fox was such a proponent of the, the monitor concept. So it occurred to me that if Fox was there and he saw the battle and he gave this to the academy, he gave a lot of things, a lot of souvenirs after the war he gave to people, 15 inch cannonballs from Fort Sumner and this and that and the other. Um, if he said that this was on the monitor and it's written in iron and it's engraved, then it had to be on the monitor. And when you look at all the drawings that are published or known, the only thing it even vaguely resembles, or it doesn't even resemble it, it accurately resembles, is the shield. So with using the skepticism of my friend saying you need a smoking gun, it occurred to me, this is a smoking gun. If Fox said it was there and and the only thing it matches is the shield, then the shield had to be there. And that's how I finally came up with the, the realization that that the shield had to be on the target during the battle. Yes. I mean, and uh, one of the things you um, have as one of your key sort of pieces of evidence, if you will, is the inventor, John Erickson, whom you're talking about, um, in one of his own drawings, he has a drawing that's called, it's called the turret shield or shield for turret. And right. you can see clearly how it goes on the side of the turret where the gun ports protrude, come out. Right. 
and it's just a, it's a squared off um, section of additional armor. Right. And um, it utterly alters the look of that turret. And you can see how it's in the designs. There's two, two illustrations of it in the original designs, which right. is it's very compelling. I mean, somebody could say, well, they designed it, but then they didn't use it. But then it's even referenced as that ah, the shield was a bust. We, we don't want it. And they took it and we took the shield off. Right. Um, yeah. And the, the piece of uh, the piece of the artifact that you mentioned, the Naval Academy Museum, um, there's a couple of very telling things on that. Why don't you describe those? One of them has to do with the arc of a circle geometrically, and the right. other has to do with a really nasty uh, um, bit of damage on the other end of it. Right. Well, there, there's a couple of things about the the, the um, remnant, the artifact itself. Um, first thing is it matches the drawing so well. Now, if someone was to say, is it perfect? It, it's not, you know, the, um, but the, 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 the symmetry of the, of the, the rivet holes and the, um, uh, or, or the bolts, I don't know if it's rivets or bolts, the, the proportion of them, where they're laid out, they, they don't match up exactly inch by inch, but the proportionality is, is perfect. Um, the thickness of it matches what's in the drawing. It, it's one inch thick. Um, the deck plating was half inch thick. Um, the only one inch thick plating on the sh on the ship was, was the armor on the side of the ship and the, and the turret and, and the shield. Um, the cutout in it matches the, the gun ports exactly. Um, it's not close to it. It matches the exact shape and form of the gun ports, um, and then the side of it. And then three sides of of, of the artifact are squared off and, and, and finished and, and and at ninety degrees, but one side is, is damaged. I mean, it's broken. It's it's it you know, something tore that metal apart. So if you if you the art, artifact now is is um, uh, uh, mounted, it, it's displayed horizontally. But if you take it and turn it vertically, then the gun port, the, the curve part li lines up with the gun port, the side lines up with where the two pieces come together in the drawing, and the other side lines up with where the major damage was to the turret during the, the battle. The turret was hit, I don't remember offhand a certain number of times during the battle. Some from the Virginia, some from the Minnesota also hit the turret. But on on the um, the right hand or starboard gun port to the to the right of that, when you look at the drawings, there's three clear indentation marks. In fact, I don't know if if you can see this, but there you go. So here's mm -hmm. The, the starboard turret. Here's the the two turrets in the front. Here's the, the starboard turret, and this is highlighted a little bit. Uh, it's hard to. There you go. Yeah, there it is. Where, where those three shot marks are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Over here. Right. And then the. Uh, no, we're good. The 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 shield. No, I don't. I don't know how clear this will be because it's well. The shield looks like like so. Right. It fits then, it's exactly like a jigsaw puzzle piece, right, right on that spot. Right on that spot. And if you put if you put the shield in front of the turret, and this is going to be hard for me to do, but yeah, you almost right got it a little more this way. There you go. You got to bring it over closer. Yeah, now bring yeah. it up. Yeah, that's yeah, that's close to it. But what what's what. remarkable about what you just showed there, Fran, is that yeah, the all the famous um, photographs of the monitor taken months later. There's um you know there's deck shots of the monitor, and there's there's one that you can clearly see where the um the turret damage occurred. It's exactly where when you jigsaw puzzle that. Piece the artifact onto it with the gun port. It's exactly where the damage is on that as well. Exactly, exactly. That plus the fact that the curve of the of the uh, cutout fits exactly along the side of the gun port, um, in the same like circular dimension angle of it, whatever. 
it's just uncanny once you see that. Right. And, and, and in fact, um, you, you know this vessel well. You've worked on the restoration of it. You've been inside and out of it. Um, there's no other piece on the monitor that it could be once you start to realize that. Where else would it go with that with those particular elements evident in it? You know? Well, and that, that's what, again, brought me back to the smoking gun because there's no other part of the ship that has that shape to it. There's no other part that has that arrangement of, of, uh, of, of, of ribbit or, or bolt holes. I mean, it's not a deck plate. It's too thick for a deck plate. And the deck plates were very strategically bolted together. Um, the turret itself, the plates, well, one of the difference between this plate and the turret plate is this is flat. This doesn't have a curve like a turret. Right. So, and, and even in the right. turret, the, the bolt holes in the turret are all symmetrical to each other, but they don't have that 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 mm -hmm. the, the the additional uh, uh, bolt holes around the gun ports itself. Mm -hmm. um, the coal scu scuttles um, don't have any spe specific thing to them, uh, so you can. You can look around the the ship as much as as you can, and there's nothing else that matches. I mean, it's not, but there's something else it could be. I mean, there's nothing else that even comes close to looking like this does right. th this artifact in comparison to the turret shield. Right. I mean, especially the fact is that cutout. You can see the actual edge of the cutout, the circular edge, very right. finely cut out of it. That doesn't go anywhere else, and the and the ship. No. And then that combined with the fact where the damage on it is, is exactly matching that photo where the damage is on the turret after they removed it, right? right. right there, kind of plow right. right through it. You can see why they said to heck with this thing. It's yeah. not even, it didn't even do that much good. Right. Just, Eric, just w one second. I just, for people who haven't seen the article, let me just show two quick things so that we get an idea of what we're talking about. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, Hopefully you can see this. I may have to stand up. This is a, a um, print I made of the artifact uh, and the bolt holes. Now this is how it's mounted in the museum. And it's gonna be hard to do because of the, the, the camera, but in reality, it would right. have been like this, mm -hmm. okay? And you can see th this is, this is the, curve of where the gun port was right these are the, the bolts that hold it together here's a, a, a seam over here where it would butt up against another plate and then this area here i don't know how clear this is in, in this lighting but this is this is uh smooth and even this is just damage that's there and then in addition Can you see this at all, or is it too too? too you look, well, we can recreate the um, image from the, the of this okay. same illustration right. that's in, with, the, with the article. Fine. I just wanted you know that you can actually see that. Uh, I'm not just saying oh it couldn't be anything else. When you look at it in in person, or if you look at a right. picture of it and the drawing, there's nothing else it could be. Right, and there's the, the two different illustrations from the original plans show it from different positions. They show the front on, just here's what it looks like if you're looking straight at it. Then they show a bird's eye view of it looking down, if you're like over the turret looking down. And you can see how it comes out as a squared off section from the roundness of the turret. Right, right. and two, um, two interesting things about that is one, in the drawing of the shield itself, where you see the whole shield and the dimensions on it and how it was supposed to be made, that was drawn by Charles McCord, who was Erickson's chief draftsman. In the second drawing you're talking about, where you see the turret from the, the top, and actually there's some side views, that, that drawing is called turret details. And that's done in Erickson's hand. He drew that. He, he drew it and he signed it. And it, in, in, in ink, 
are the chart details. But in the original drawing, in pencil, you see his calculations for the size of the plates, how heavy the plates were going to be, where they were going to go. And he clearly shows this shield in front of the turret. Now, it's in Erickson's hand. So, I mean, if he, at that time, when he was designing the monitor, if that wasn't at least a concept, he wouldn't have put it in there. Now, someone could say, well, that's an early design. Maybe it changed. Well, maybe it did change, but we have this piece of iron at the Academy that matches it. So it's like, well, it maybe it changed, but I don't think so. And to uh, another clue you um, unearth in digging this story out is that there's a record of them removing the shield from the monitor after the battle. Was it, was right. it was like two weeks after the battle, I think? They were it clear. was on the 21st. So okay. the battle so, was on the 9th. So uh, it was the 21st. That was about two weeks later or so. Right. Um, so and, there's a clear written record in the official records. Of, we removed this shield off of there. We just right. took it off. And, right. Now, now another, um, another part of that, don't interrupt you, but um, people are going to say, well, what about the early, not, you know, the early drawings that were made of the monitor before the battle? Mm hmm if you look at those closely, they don't show the shield, but if you also look at them, none of them are, are accurate. They show the monitor going the wrong direction. They show it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think one of the ones my favorite is they show the the pilot house being at the stern and the smokestacks mm -hmm. being in, in, in the bow. Um, and then good drawings, accurate drawings were made by Harper's um, weekly or m monthly, but the, that artist showed up on the monitor on August 25th. So he got to the monitor about four days after the, the shield was, was, had been removed. There you go. Yeah. It just somehow slipped through the cracks. Um, yeah. Now, it was to, it was, here's where it's a little bit maddening in terms of like you've got this incredibly tantalizing, they all fit together series of clues. Yes, the turret was taken, removed and taken off the monitor, and it was towed away on a tug, right? Mm -hmm. And here's where it, we, we hit a wall because the records of that tug, the log of that tug, is no longer with us. Is that correct? Well, the log for that particular time isn't there. Um, yeah. I've looked at, at the log from the, from the tug, um, and I don't remember the exact dates. I mean, it, it's probably online at, at the uh, National Archives. Um, a lot of the records of the tug exist, and I, I, I'll tell you, that's another whole story that you could you could publish. That little tug, its its records, it was scooting all over Hampton Roads. It was picking up ammunition in one place. It was picking up people in another place, and and the poor guys in that tug, they 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 were working like 14, 18 hour days just moving equipment and, and it, it's a fascinating read but unfortunately for this particular time period um th th that log is missing yeah well this was taken off as just a um sort of a a prehensile element we don't need this it didn't really do much good right. let's get it off of there and fortunately um it was that piece of it was saved as a, a memento if you will Right. And uh, that's what set all this in motion. Um, right. well, this is fascinating uh, to me because everybody is such a, a a presumed picture in everyone's mind of how this vessel looked. And true, it did look like that after they removed the shield off it. But in the famous first clash of ironclads, it would have looked different with that shield. Now, I'm, I would ask you to speculate. How did something like this get sort of forgotten or overlooked by history? Uh, it just somehow fell through the cracks of the historical memory. Well, I, I think there are a couple of answers to that. First, I, I think that if you could go back and talk to the people who were there, they would just go, yeah, of course it was there. You know, <laughs> it was it was there, didn't work. We took it off and that, that was the end of it. Um, Erickson himself um, had a huge ego. Uh, he was very good at self-promoting. I think that he would always take great credit for the things that worked well and the things that didn't work well, he would try to bury as much as he could. Um, there's a 
reference to that in his biography where before he passed away, he burnt a lot of his papers and his mm -hmm. um, biographer, his, his secretary said, don't do that. What are you doing? He said, I don't want anyone to know my failures and I don't want anyone to build on what I haven't built yet. So it, mm. uh, it, it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, then the other thing that I was thinking of is that there may still be, hopefully will come to, to, to pass a, a, a drawing somewhere of showing the shield in place. But I think the other answer to that is that if people did have drawings of the shield in place, you know, people would say, What's this? That's not how the monitor looked. Are you crazy? You know? right. So uh, there's a real good chance that maybe somebody sent a letter home in in, in a uh, in a letter uh, drawing home in a letter, and years later their family saw it and they go, "This doesn't make any sense," and they throw it away. Um, I really expect that someday, some letter somewhere. Well, you know, again, coming back. As far as the shield is concerned, we've got different aspects to corroborate the information. I mean, there's the notation in the log, and that notation had to be written, was written by two people, the, the person who was on watch that time, and then the, the, um, the officer who was on duty who had to approve it. And then the, uh, the commanding officer also would, would see that and now this is a draft log. It's not the final log. So that's two people firsthand that saw it. Then you have Fox who wrote on the art artifact that was there. Um, and then you had Steimers. Shortly after the battle that day, he's writing Erickson letter and saying, the turret's marvelous. The pendulums are good. Shield, not, not so much. Um, and the only part on the ship according to the drawings that's labeled shield is that one drawing from the cord that says turret shield. The log entry says the same thing. We removed the, the, the shield of the turret. Um, right. So I, I it think that, been there. If you yeah. Think of it. Yeah. So I, I think that um, sometime more other additional verification will come. But when you look at, where this is, I mean, this isn't some coal heaver or a private on the shore who said, hey, I saw this. I mean, these are the officers of the ship, the assistant secretary of the Navy, um, and and Steimers, who was the chief, who would go on to become the, the chief of the ironclad board, uh, who was in control of all the ironclads. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, you know, they're pretty not just reputable, they're like these sources. Right. You know, now that we're talking about it, it kind of dawns on me another factor here is, okay, the turret shield was removed. So we have a tangible sort of uh, trail that right. this was there and it was not thought much of and it was removed in the uh, in not long after the battle. Um, was much else removed um, besides that? I mean, I'm sure there's other damaged parts and whatnot, but... Well, you know, they collected a lot of souvenirs um, off the ship. And then the other part is, is when it came back to um, Washington Navy Yard to, to refit, um, they took off bunches of things. Uh, mm -hmm. They took off, uh, there's a, at the Mariners Museum in a case, there's a cane and the top of the cane, the, the pommel is made from a bolt from the turret that the, um, mm -hmm. uh, the person was in charge of the, of the uh, uh, shipyard, uh, the, the, the New York, Washington Naval Shipyard at the time had made for him. Um, I would be very curious to know what happened. If, if you recall the battle itself, it ended pr pretty much when warden was injured when a shell from the virginia hit the pilot house and damaged one of the the logs so the pilot house is built up like a log cabin of, of rectangular iron logs that were about six inches thick and it damaged one of those logs i wouldn't be surprised if that didn't end up somewhere i mean it would it'd be heavy but you know you'd think that that would be a huge memento f from it right. um the other thing that I didn't mention in, in the article is there are also there is also a plate at the at West Point that was given 
by Fox to the, the West Point Museum. And the reason I didn't include it in the article is because it doesn't have any good pro pro provenance, provenance to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Fox gave it to him. It's not inscribed like the one at the Naval Academy. It looks like one of the plates from, from the side, but they don't have good measurements on it. A, a curious side story to that is that originally Fox gave the West Point three plates and they had index numbers and everything. They displayed one. Again, it just, it, all it says is a plate from the monitor given by Gustavus Fox. Fox. And in their records, they have the three plates up until about 19, well, they did an inventory in like 1935 and they had three plates. The next inventory they did was in about 1950 and they only had one plate. Oh. Um, and the question is, is what, what happened? Well, my guess is, is that during World War II, when there was an iron shortage, they said, well, we haven't displayed these in 100 years. We're not even sure what they are. We're just going to recycle them. So there's a chance a piece of the monitor either ended up in a tank or, or a, a World War II Navy ship going back to fight, uh, uh, you know, in, in World War II. He really should have inscribed this like he did for the one at the academy. I and know, I know. It, it the one at the West Point is just it, it it's it's so nondescript. It's just mm -hmm. so um, it, 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 it's hard to make any connection with it because it just doesn't have any real issue. I mean, it it, it aside from the the one note that's on it. Right. I would imagine most of this scrap that came off of it. Um, whenever they refitted it or repaired it or whatnot, was kind of generic like that. This piece, however, was unique. It's, it stands out in, in terms of its unique elements. And it's also um, inscribed over, you know, etched into this iron itself to the Academy with the date. Um, there wouldn't be a lot more because by the end of the year, of course, the monitor was lost to all. Uh, right. You know, it was lost uh, see, yeah. in, until the resurfaced again in our time. So, uh, can I just add, how much else it could be? Yes. Yeah. Can I add one one thing to that? So I've been interested in this now for ever since I was about eight years old. I, I started getting interested when I was a, a, a kid. We had the the, the um, childhood diseases, you know, measles, mumps, chicken pox. And you ended up being in bed for a week and you couldn't. And my mom gave me this book she got from the library called "The Monitor in the Merrimack" by Fletcher Pratt. I read that. Did you? It was yeah. my introduction to it as well. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and it's got a great drawing in it. But the other part is that for people who aren't familiar, um, the, the, the battle, especially if you're an eight-year-old kid, this battle is, is like epic. It, it's like almost mythological. You know, they take – the Union has all their, their warships in Hampton Roads, and the Confederacy takes this sunken – ship that hardly worked and reconfigure it into the Merrimack and it comes out. I mean, and the way it's built, it's almost like this Frankenstein monster that's coming right. out, you know, and it goes and it destroys the Union fleet one day. Um, then the next day, after a lot of trials and tribulations, this little tiny two gun ship comes out against a 10 gun ship, you know, the, the Virginia. And it's like, now you have going from the Frankenstein to this David and Goliath thing. Yeah, and they battle yeah. and they battle and they battle, and then at the end of the battle, it's like, well, who won? Well, we don't know because you know we say we won, you say you won, and then at that time, you know, they hadn't found the monitor. In the book, if, if it, 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 it says they had no idea where the drawings were, well, the drawings were in Stevens Institute, but people didn't know it at the time. So if you're this kid, it's like this mythical mm -hmm. you know contest with all these unknowns and i guess for me one of the iron plate things is is that this was just another unknown that bugged me for years until finally it hit me in the head it's like duh you know mm -hmm. if fox said it was there and he was there then it must have been there and the only thing it could be was the shield because that's the only thing it can be so the shield had to be there yeah i i'm telling you i i have a sense here now We'll see what kind of um, what kind of feedback we get from all this. But I have a sense that you've essentially rewritten the history of the USS Monitor and uh, 
I mean, we're talking about a, a, a detail of its architecture, but this is such an iconic ship that with such an iconic look that something like that kind of rewrites the history books about it a little bit. This is very exciting to see something like this. And we didn't always see this kind of thing um, with a historical publication. Um, it reminds me actually of uh, the whole fouled anchors uh, debate that arose where, you know, growing up, we all thought the uh, Constellation in Baltimore Harbor was the frigate Constellation, right. the original six frigates, and uh, that's no longer the official line. And it, this, this to me, kind of shakes the paradigm the way that did back in, I think it was the 90s. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really curious to see what happens from this. But uh, I, my hat's off to you because uh, this is the kind of groundbreaking thing we don't see all the time. Well, well, th well thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, it's been a labor of love, I'll, I'll tell you. It's, um, you know, if you, if you have um, any interest uh it's fun to learn more about it and the monitor as i when i was little so much was unknown but even today um so much is still un unknown um mm -hmm. there's still mysteries to be solved and uh maybe we'll find some more yes amen to that history is never finished we like no. to live by those words here and you've become proof positive of that with your efforts i urge everybody to read this it's the cover story of the March, April issue of Naval History Magazine, and it is a game changer, folks. Fran, it's so great to talk with you, and uh, this is fascinating stuff, and I'm sure that we'll see how this unfolds as time goes on now. Um, again, congratulations to you, and thank you for joining us, and we look forward to uh, seeing further revelations from you on whatever it may be in the magazine <laughs> in the future. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much, and I appreciate your, your support because... Um, yeah, the, the magazine had to go out on a little bit of a limb and and and, and leap of faith and, and look at this and say, you know, this has some merit because, as I said, I showed the same thing to a very well-known historian a few years ago, and he said, where's your smoking gun? But I think well, I found it. I do, too. I think you may have found that smoking gun, all right. Well, much to think about here, folks. That's it for us today. Um, read the article. See what you think. Um, I have a feeling you may be convinced. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills. Until next time, farewell. <laughs>